Okay, we're back. We're live for the 2 o'clock block here on Think Tech on a given Friday. It feels like Monday, doesn't it? And we have Julian Goback. He's an assistant professor of journalism at the journalism program in the School of Communication at UH Manoa. And we like so much to have him here because he helps us get a philosophical lift on things. And among other things, he is a, among being a, a journalist and a, a reporter par excellence um, and a philosopher. Call it a media philosopher, you know, uh, serious. Uh -huh. um, he's also a scholar uh, in the Holocaust. It's very important. So today we're going to talk about, you know, the public discussion around Holocaust. And before the show began, Julian, I was asking you uh, or suggesting that me, myself, I have, I have I've always been concerned about uh, the denial of the Holocaust, but it hasn't been that long. When did the denial, when did you hear voices of the denial? Was it 1960, 1970, as late as 1980? But those voices seem to have taken root these days, and there are a lot of people and groups in the world who deny it, or if they don't affirmatively deny it, they forget about it. It's inconsequential to them. Um, this is very troubling. Are you, you think those thoughts too? Um, yeah, I, I don't know when um, Holocaust denial really took off. Um, I've never really read um, about the subject, but I, I, I do know, you know, just from what I've learned about, like, Deborah Lipstadt, the, 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 the woman who's, you know, written, uh, is a major Holocaust scholar, um, that, that certainly by the 80s, uh, Holocaust denial was, um, was going on, was a real thing, mm. and there were, you know, Holocaust revisionism. I guess, efforts to kind of write the Holocaust out of history or deny yeah. Because David Irving was, was publishing, you know, the one who um, tried to sue Lipstadt for libel when she accused him of uh, Holocaust denial. His books were being published in the 80s, and um, so she was pointing to those. Um, you know. So he, he denied the Holocaust, uh, and she sued him. Well, yeah, he I, sued her for speaking out for the proposition that he was denying the Holocaust. Yeah, um, I think that, as far as I know, um, and I, and again, I, I'm I'm not even really well versed altogether in that case, except uh, that I do know that uh, that when she originally was criticizing him, it was it was it had already evolved to the point where Irving had set himself up as a serious scholar, even though he's, he doesn't have a doctorate or anything. You know, I don't think he has very much formal education, but he had taught himself German, and he was one of the first people to really dig deep into the, the Nazi archives, the German archives uh, in German. Of course, what, what came out during the trial was that he had been digging into the archives, but he had also been um s screwing with the with what the, the german actually said what the documents actually said he he had been misrepresenting what the texts were but uh but he had i think i believe he had like set up a sort of a pseudo academic journal i mean it had all the appearances of a serious academic journal but it was basically a home for holocaust denialism and and that was already up and running by the 90s by the time she started pointing him out, because her point wasn't just that he was a run-of-the-mill denialist or revisionist, it was that, that he had developed this whole kind of veneer about him of, of being a serious scholar, and, and it brought all these other revisionists, Holocaust revisionists, along with it. And then he sued her in, she's of course American, American Jewish scholar, but um, he sued her in England because the Holocaust, I mean, the, the libel laws are uh, much stricter than they are in the United States. And so, oddly enough, in England, um, and in her case, um, the burden of proof is on the person accused, which is oddly enough, uh, odd, odd enough, because you would think that the burden of proof would be on the accuser mm -hmm. for libel, but she actually had to prove that she was not guilty of libel, uh, which set a pretty high bar, but they, they met it. This is so similar to the QB7 novel, mm -hmm. um, where um, 
a, uh, I guess a writer pointed out that a particular person was associated with the Nazis, and uh, he sued the writer, the Nazi sued the writer, and, um, and then the writer had to prove that he was a Nazi, that the Nazi was a Nazi. It was the same burden of proof issue yeah. at QB7 as Queen's Bench 7, uh -huh. uh, a, a British court in London. Wow. It's the same story, except that was fiction. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, here's a hard question for you, though. Um, what is, is, there, is there a connection between denial and anti-Semitism? Um, I mean, I, I think that uh, the issues, like in the David Irving case, were really on top of each other, because a lot of what it came down to in, in the, the, I think, the final stretches of the case were whether um, David Irving really believed what he was arguing because uh, he was an anti-Semite um, or, or not. But um, I, I, I don't know, but, I, I, you know, I mean, this gets into intentionality and, and all that kind of thing, but I, I, it would be hard for me to understand why you would want to argue against what had happened to the Jews in Germany. I mean, I don't know. You know, there's an interesting case of of um, of uh, 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 Schulzberger. You know, the um, the guys, the the family that had owned the um, uh, New York Times and oh, yeah, yeah, Arthur yeah. Hayes Schulzberger, so, and yeah. and and um, the fact that that because he he was part of the reformist Jewish. Uh, movement of the early 20th century. In that time, um, you could argue that this it was a kind of self-hatred, Jewish self-hatred, but there was a, an effort, you know, there was that conflict between the German Jews that had been there since the mid-19th century and the boatloads of uh, East European Jews that had started to appear it by the late 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, and there was a uh, you could argue coming out of that, the, the, or it's been argued, that the, that the reformist movement tried to stipulate that, well, you, Jew, Judaism wasn't a peoplehood. It was a belief, like you, it was a religion, not a peoplehood. And so, therefore, you weren't actually Jewish unless you practiced Judaism, believed in Judaism. In other words, you weren't born Jewish just because your parents were Jewish. And um, that... That kind of seeped into the editorial policy of the New York Times during the coverage of the Holocaust because mm -hmm. um, that meant that the, the editorial policy of the New York Times during that whole catastrophe was to refer to Jewish victims as people or refugees, but not as Jews, even though they were being you know, forced to wear the Jewish stars. by the Nazis. And, yeah, even though they were, they were um, traced as Jews through their, through their blood and uh, ha were forced to wear the Jewish star. It didn't matter whether you believed in well, Judaism wrong, or not. It? And they were slaughtered for that. But, but the way that it was being reported in, Amer in the, the leading American newspaper was not that they were being targeted or murdered for being Jews, but that they were people who, who were targeted by the Nazis. So... Mm. It, it, it clouded things, so you could argue, you know, to the extent that that would be denialism, but still you have that kind of overlap even in that kind of horrific story because, yeah. uh, because you could argue that there was kind of, a, uh, in a way, a self-hatred um, that Sulzberger felt. Well, Laurel Leff, by the way, who's a professor at Northeastern and a friend of mine, wrote Buried by the Times, which is, really lays out this whole argument. Mm, interesting. So, but back to my question is, uh, if I'm just giving you my own logic. Yeah. Um, we know, we who have cracked a book at any point in our lives, yeah. we know that the Holocaust took place. Right. And it's not even cracking a book. It's watching all the, the movies and all the media that have, you know, been, been covering our society globally uh, for the past 75 years. We know the Holocaust took place. There is no basis for denial, none. And yet there are people who deny. 
Could they be anything other than anti-Semitic? Um, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I guess that you know some people are can be manipulated, um, and there's always that worry. But I think that. Mm, yeah. It, I mean, we're into deep speculation. I mean, I, to, to me, it, it's, you know, for all intents and purposes, the important thing is the way it, it plays into people's animosities. That they're, you know, that, that the reason why it's either, either for the people who are preaching it or for the people where that belief that it didn't happen takes root in them it ha it has to do with playing on the idea that they're the Jews are seeking some kind of special pleading that they're gaining some advantage from from uh, claiming victimhood that they they claim to be special victims or unique victims and that then you get into um, what you're playing on in order to get people to believe that it never happened is is some underlying sentiments of these people over here are Jews, and they're not me, and I don't like these people. They seem to be doing A, B, or C. It's that kind of xenophobia, the, the, the kind of typical stuff that, uh, that people feel that I guess is you know, embedded in us being people to see other people and say, well, we don't like them because they're other people, you know, playing one group of people off another, that kind of thing. And that, that seems to be, to me, but we're psychologizing about it. I mean, you know, and so you're, you're, you're necessarily speculating when you do that. Yeah. If we had somebody here at this table who was a denier, I would really love to ask that person some questions and see what the psychology was. But let's move on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's move on to what brought us together on this uh, occasion. Uh, and that is uh, the, uh, anal uh, analogizing concentration camps and Nazis to current events, yeah. uh, which, which happened in the news. Uh, and this is a controversy, if you want to call it that, over uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's Cortez. uh, recent remarks uh, about concentration camps, which some people feel is a special term reserved to real concentration camps as they existed in the 30s and 40s. Uh, and Nazis as they existed in the 30s and 40s. Can you describe this controversy so we can get a, a handle on it? Yeah, um, well, one of, one of the things I try and do, um, it's interesting because you said before um, that I, I, you sort of see me as a, as a philosopher, that I philosophize. I and, do. And I, you know, I, I'm a historian um, or media historian, um, but there's a reason why I think that you sort of see the, psych, the, the philosophical side of that because philosophy is a really important part of it. But, but we can get into that in a minute. The, the point is, is that one of the things I, I like to do, uh, whether we're talking about the original history or like this okay. controversy, is, to, uh, is to, to, to look very carefully to trace the lines of thought, what's said and, you know, the actual words and, and, and that. And, and to the extent that the, what we say also represents what we think. And so Ocasio-Cortez had put this out on Instagram and, um, and then had uh, also tweeted it, but it was basically she had referred to the current um, detention facilities that Children we have the for, for the, yeah, for the, well, for all the migrants, I think, but, but you know, we've been particularly concerned about the treatment of the children, um, although the treatment of the adults has been pretty egregious too. Um, but uh, she compared that to concentration camps, but she also evoked, and I think like it was a two sentence kind of a statement, a very brief one, but the second one was uh, she evoked the, the never again um, sort of. Uh, oh, never uh, again, right. Which is, I, mean, about the I don't know if you had this experience, but I, I grew up with that term, never again. Right, with, with uh, the Holocaust, like, let's never hap let this happen again. Yeah, we can't again. let that happen again. So then, the, the, I think one of the initial responses was from Yad Vashem, the Israeli official Yad Vashem Holocaust is the Holocaust Museum, Museum in Israel. Yeah. Um, and there's some interesting reporting that's gone on um, about the connection between 
uh, the, the, the statements of Yad Vashem now and its management and, and the connection between that and the Netanyahu government um, and their politics. Um, but they immediately responded by saying um, basically that, that she should, that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez should educate herself about concentration camps um, and the Jews and um, talking about the fact that uh, the statement went on about how like the concentration camps had been these labor camps to kind of work Jews to death and then the gassing that went on in them and arguing that uh, that by comparing what was going on in the current American uh, facilities to the concentration camp, she was belitt belittling the cruelty that the Jews had suffered. Um, and then the United States Holocaust Museum came out with a statement referencing a, a, another statement from, from months earlier, and the headline of that was, I think, Why Holocaust uh, Analogies Are Dangerous. And it was written by a, a historian who works for the Holocaust Museum that um, the, the original statement that the, that the new you, you know, Memorial Museum had uh, referred to was um, a longer piece that was written months ago by Edna Friedberg, who's, a, who's this historian. And it was, it's not really exactly a statement. It was, it was kind of an essay, in a way, um, arguing that, that, it's, that analogies to the Holocaust have been used and abused in all these different kinds and of ways. And what the message is, don't. Don't make the analogies. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, not to mischaracterize her. I mean, now we're getting, you know, it, it's become particularly important to be precise in language or whatever. Yes, it is. It's and, a really sensitive and, subject. And so she's pushing back and saying, be very careful because the analogies can be dangerous and the Holocaust has been used and abused in all these different ways. We don't want you to abuse these words now. And, and she, she brought up some interesting examples, um, some of which kind of bothered me um, that she tried to use them as examples of ways the Holocaust has been abused. Like what? Well, I mean, one of her examples of how it's been terribly abused was uh, that animal rights groups have referred to, like, the Holocaust on your plate. Um, that's, and, a, that's a long way. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I, I, you know, Jay, I mean, it's interesting because you've heard me talk about denial and climate change and the mass extinction of species. And um, I think that, um, you know, I, I'm someone who's in front of young people every day who are looking at really, really serious environmental problems in this, in this world and are looking at, you know, by the time they're 50 years old or older, what's our world gonna look at? And I don't think that they consider treatment of other species or uh, treatment of animals to be, I mean, I, I think that older generations, you know, had different views of animal rights and, and saw animals over here and humans over here, and it was offensive to talk about the dign dignity of animal life in the same category of human life. And it was considered, to a large extent, like a, a bizarre or irrational to talk about the cruelty that, of experimenting on animals, for example, for medical research. Um, you know, I know, I remember my, my father's generation, my father's a, a physician, and, and for a number of people in his generation, they thought animal rights people were crazy for trying to push back on experimenting on animals. But I, I, I don't know, I mean, I, th I think that like, I mean, does anyone want to sit through? I've never been able to sit through a documentary about the, how the slaughterhouse industry works or whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's horrifying. Uh, the fact that we ignore it every day doesn't mean that it isn't horrifying. And I think that people who take that seriously aren't trying to belittle the Holocaust. I think to the contrary, um, I think that they, they just see some of this stuff mm -hmm. differently. And so for her to kind of... To me, it bothered me that she trotted that out as an example of ways we abuse the Holocaust because uh, in, in, in a future time, we may look at the way that we you know, treat animals when we, when, in our massive slaughterhouse industry with horror um, because of the way we do it. Well, this is its usage. It's English 
<clears throat> you're a professor of journalism. Is usage, do usages change? The definitions of words change. Even words that are highly charged at one point in history, uh, they become in different use. No? Well, I mean, I think, I th you know, I, I, I think this whole controversy is the reason why I, I, I talk to you about it. I, I think it's really interesting to talk about it is it's very deep controversy with, with very strong arguments on both sides, both of which need to be respected. Mm -hmm. I think there's a real case to be made um, that uh, a real concern about belittling um, or, or not doing due respect um, to the to the memory of of the victims of the Holocaust uh, and kind of being sloppy in the way we we throw around the ideas, but I also think that like a lot of us would never have become historians or would never dig into history if we didn't feel like it was important. And it's not important because it happened in the past. It's important because of what's happening today. It, it informs us <clears throat> of things that happen. And, right and I mean, if you just think about the conversation, you know, this is not the first time I've been on your show, and if you think about, and it's not the first time we've talked about the Holocaust, and if we were to now have to go back to every conversation we've had about relating the Holocaust and pick it apart and say, well, that's offensive for you to relate it to this, or that's offensive for you to relate it to that, I, I mean, I think we've needed to talk about the Holocaust, mm -hmm. but, at, but at the same time, I mean, we, you and I could sit here and we could come up with examples. Um, I mean, like I remember people compared um, Obamacare to the Holocaust. People compared <laughs> um, uh, efforts to enforce gun control to the Nazis and to Nazism. Um, and now, as liberals... Uh, <clears throat> Seinfeld had the soup Nazi. Yeah, the, okay. So the, Seinfeld the, the, had the soup Nazi, and he was a soup Nazi because you had a have his soup. Right. Uh, and it, it just, it was a takeoff on that word. Maybe we forgot exactly what the details are, but we remembered that the Nazis were very methodical and disciplined, and they didn't make exceptions to the rules and all, all that sort of hard, hard scrapple kind of way of dealing with people. Um, but see, this, this gets at the heart of like what's good history and what's bad history, right? And when you said um, you sort of see me as a bit of a philosopher. There's, there's, there's different schools of history, okay? One of them is political history, what's been called like kings and battles. We say, okay, Hitler rose to power, there was the Battle of the Bulge, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the kind of hard facts and events of, of po political history are very traditional history that goes way back. Uh, but another very long-standing uh, school of history is intellectual history, which is the argument that, that ideas, not events, are what make history. So like when, when Caesar crosses the Rubicon, as an event, that literally might have been a guy walks across a river called the Rubicon. But the Rubicon meant certain things to Caesar and to the Romans at the time. And so Caesar crossing the Rubicon wasn't just this guy crossing a river because of what ideas mean. And so, um, so like a lot of language and like concentration camps or, or other terms, we have to be, as historians and doing good history, you have to look at what the word meant at the time to the people using it. Absolutely. Like the, the, somebody uh, wrote a book called The Collaboration, which was basically accusing um, Jewish movie moguls of collaborating with the Nazis in suppressing the persecution of Jews from the, the Hollywood movie screens. And that created this uproar. Part of his argument was, um, well, I went back and looked at the German archives and they're using this word and I think he even goes so far to talk about the different words in German for collaboration and how it's used, et cetera. But, um, but so these words can get really loaded. Like I, I refer, you know, I've written a biography and I refer to the main, you know, the subject of it, Ben Hecht, as a romanticist. I don't mean he's romantic in the way like when you give somebody a Hallmark card for Valentine's Day, <laughs> that's very romantic. I, I'm talking about the debate between the people who were the kind of supporters of the Enlightenment and the next generation that came that pushed back on that that we call the Romanticists. 
which doesn't really have much to do with being romantic and being sentimental. Yeah, or the specific events of history is the, is the ideas of history. No? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, you and, know, and the words and what the and the fact that words like a word that we use now, like race, you know, meant something to people in 1865 that it doesn't necessarily mean oh, to people in, in you know, 2019. What's the piece now where people feel that the flag that Betsy Ross was uh, was faithful to? The American 13 states, 13 colony flag back in 1776 mm -hmm. um, is negative. Uh, and that, uh, oh, people are adopting this flag as a statement of white supremacy. It's very interesting. They don't know that this was the original flag of, of, of the United States as it was formed. They yeah. don't know that. But they attach to it white supremacy. Uh, it becomes the Confederate flag brought current. I mean, in the public mind. Yes, yeah, so it's very strange how it, it all changes, and it's totally inaccurate. So one of the issues with concentration camps is that the, the word existed before you had uh, the Nazis moving into the, the 1943 final solution stage. You know, there were, there were concentration camps before there was a Nazi Germany. Um, so to some degree, are we saying that... Um, that, that uh, Alexandria Ocasio. Now, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. I'm, I doubt she thought all this, that kind of thing through. Like she didn't know that. I don't think she was like saying it with the awareness of like, oh well, concentration camps were used at the time of the Boer War. She was using lingo, and um, you know she's in a, a generation that yeah. uses lingo. But be, we're almost out of time. Um, yeah. how, how quickly the time passes, Julian. Um, you uh, joined in a letter. Right. on this very issue about um, analogizing the terms of concentration camps and never again and Nazis uh, by her and others. Um, you, you signed a letter with your view of that. Can you talk about that letter for a moment? Well, it, you know, I, I, I had already had my own thinking about it. But what I found really striking when I actually found out there was this letter that all other scholars, I think there's something like 400 of us now who signed it, uh, it, it's an extremely strong statement because it, 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 what it says is that the United States Holocaust Museum has put their credibility on the line and that they're really in danger right now of damaging their relationship with the academic community unless they, it, it, the letter kind of demands that they retract these recent statements. Um, and as far as I know, there hasn't been a response yet from the United States Holocaust Museum, but I'm eager for them to make them because I do think that uh, that at a certain point um, they need to add some nuance. Certainly, that headline, "Why Holocaust Analogies Are Dangerous," um, is is pretty strong, and there there needs to be more nuance. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, one of my own views is that there's all these really important aspects of the Holocaust. I mean, if we're going to get outraged at Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, that's pretty distorted because we've allowed President Trump to campaign and use as a motto, America first. You cannot, if you want to talk about offensive terminology or abusing phrases or terms from the Holocaust, you cannot get more offensive than to resurrect as a motto for American foreign policy the phrase America first. So before we have a controversy over what concentration camps mean or don't mean when some liberal in Congress uses it, we should talk about the, the American president's use of America first, which was an isolationist kind of Nazi sympathizing phrase, highly nativist at a time when Jews were trying to escape Hitler and come to America. It was, the, it was the slogan of the people that were for immigration restriction in the late 1930s and 40s. And people should understand that the reason why we have the asylum laws that are now so much in contest right now, that, that is really a lot of the focus of this whole detention center and all of that, is those laws were drafted the way they're drafted because of the Jewish refugee uh, issue. And you the fact that we did not masses yearning to no no free. I'm talking about 
I'm talking about American immigration oh, policy during the 1930s and the 40s. Yeah, the asylum status of, of Jewish refugees trying to escape um, uh, Hitler at the time and the way that our policies treated them and also the dishonesty. There was an investigation by the Treasury Department of Breckenridge Long and the State Department that blew up in 1943 over this because they were, they were actually not even meeting the quotas, the immigration quotas at the time. So there's all this ugly history. It came out with the United Nations refugee policy after the war. Um, and also the whole issue of deportees, you know, during the, 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 the post-war thing of the Holocaust survivors and what happened to them. And that led to the, the policies that then America um, took on and ad adopted an, an asylum policy out of that. Point is, we can't forget what happened. No, and there's, and no, we, and there's we, no clean break. There's you no clean break, but I think people use these terms without knowing. It would be different if they knew. It would be different if they had studied. It, it would be different if they had some idea of, of the import of these, these terms and these references. I don't, I don't think she knows. I don't think he knows. And, and it's, uh, it's loose use of language. So it takes somebody like you or a writer in the newspaper right. uh, you know, to make this right, to put it in perspective. And, and you know what? I've got to say this, too. We always get into the meat of our discussions, Julian. Right, right at the end, end of the yeah. show, yeah. You, you start going. <laughs> it's the best part, yeah. but we got to cut it now. Okay. So I hope we can do this again and follow up. There's yeah, more absolutely. to come, I'm sure. Yeah. Julian, Gorbach. thank you for having me on. Great. Great to have you. <laughs> yeah, I like to say that's fine. Okay.